Well, Jefferson Barracks uh, had a, got an early start. I mean, they, they kind of took in everyone from Bel uh, Fort Bellefontaine and you know, became a military barracks. And over the years, it's just collected so much history. So many people have been through there. And even now, after the fort has been decommissioned, and it's now used just for um, National Guard people and that kind of thing and a variety of different things, there's all kinds of ghostly stories. Uh, there's the man who stands on the hill that people have seen, the ghosts in the cemetery, and the main building there. Many times when people have passed at night, they'll look inside and they'll see a man in an old-fashioned uniform writing letters at the desk. Uh, a friend of mine was there for a couple of years, was there as part of his um, reserve duty, and he would often talk about all the people who'd had experiences sleeping in the building, hearing footsteps on the stairs. Um, there's nothing threatening, there's nothing even particularly all that scary, it just seems to be history repeating itself, and it's in this you know, confined small area of the fort. Back in the early 1900s, in the early 1920s, I guess would be the best way to put it, um, spiritualism in America had kind of taken a rebound. Well, there was a housewife who lived in St. Louis at the time whose name was Pearl Curran. And she um, was an ordinary, just a woman and her husband, he had a job, she was a housewife, she had an eighth grade education, she wasn't interested in reading or books, they went to the theater sometimes, that was about the extent of their entertainment. They would have friends over to play cards, it was a very ordinary life, until one day a friend of hers came over and brought a Ouija board. She talked Pearl into using the Ouija board. She'd never had an interest in it before. Well, when she started to use it, they started to get these very clear messages that came through from a ghost who said her name was Patience Worth and that she had a story to tell. Well, not only did this ghost keep coming through, but only when Pearl was there. After a while, Pearl was able to get messages from Patience in her head and she would write them out, and then eventually she could dictate them. Again, this normal average woman was getting messages from a ghost who then began um, creating poetry and writings and books. She published four novels in the 1920s, A Ghost Did, through Pearl Curran. She would tell her the stories, Pearl would write them down. The eerie thing about this is that the first three of the books were historical books. One was about medieval England, one was about uh, Palestine during the days of Christ, and it was filled with details that hardly anyone would know, unless you were a diehard historian at the time. Pearl Curran knew nothing. She didn't know anything about any of this. All of the material that Patience created, if she was real, and not just some split personality or something of Pearl Curran. All of that information, all that stuff is still out. It's still out there. The books are there, the poetry is still there, and all of it apparently was created by a ghost. And it's one of the biggest unsolved mysteries as far as the supernatural goes in American history. And it's a St. Louis original. The Chase Plaza Hotel is, um, it, it's a classic. I mean, it is like one of the most famous hotels in St. Louis. The famous ghost is the redhead who haunts room 304, although that's been changed to room 302. They were trying to throw people off the scent. It started with a guy, this businessman, who had come back to his room one night. He was staying in room 304, and he, he walked in. He had a long day of meetings. He walked into the room, and there is a, a, a beautiful redhead standing by the window looking out. And he's like, uh, excuse me, you know, this is, this is my room, what are you doing here? And she just ignored him, and she wouldn't respond to anything he asked her, and he didn't want to approach her because he didn't want to seem threatening. So eventually, he finally calls down to the front desk, and a security guard and a manager come up to get the woman, but by the time they get there, she's gone. But then a short time later, it happened again. One of the people who encountered her was a writer who was in St. Louis doing some work, and he encountered the woman in his room. He said he woke up at night, and she had walked across the room and then vanished into the wall. And it happened twice, and he called the front desk and, you know, in a panic, what, what do I do, what do I do? And they told him that he's imagining things, of course. So eventually the hotel um, had to grudgingly admit that Okay, people are claiming they're seeing things, but you know we're, we're sure it's just an imagination at work. And this went on for years. When they remodeled it and renovated it in the 90s, they, they had already had changed it to 302. They changed the room number. 
But finally, by the 90s, they started to admit that people are encountering this ghost. A Hitchhike Annie is a ghost that has been picked up on the road that runs between Calvary Cemetery and Bell Fountain Cemetery. That's Calvary Drive. And around that road and in the immediate area, people for years, starting in the 1940s, were picking up a young girl in a white dress who had dark hair, and they would pick her up on the side of the road. She'd try to flag down people for a ride. Sometimes she'd say that her car had broken down. Sometimes she'd say that uh, she just needed to get home and could they drop her off. And then she would give them, usually give them an address that was somewhere nearby and they would begin driving. Now the story varies from there. Sometimes she would vanish from the car as they neared the gates to Bell Fountain Cemetery. Other times she would go all the way up to the house and then when they arrived and pulled into the driveway, the address she'd given, they'd look over and she'd be gone and wouldn't be in the car anymore. So oftentimes men would go up to the door and ask, you know, hey, listen, I just had this terrible experience. Uh, I just, this girl asked me for a ride home and I needed to get her here. And uh, she disappeared before we could get out of the car. When they answer the door, they always say, oh, that's my daughter. She died in an accident uh, 10 years ago on this date and she's been trying to get home ever since. Now, Hitchhike Annie was not just an urban legend, though, apparently, because she was picked up not only by reputable people, I mean, police officers, ministers, people who told about their experiences with Annie as she became known, uh, but it just sort of seemed to fade out in the mid 80s. So for about 40 years, she was around. We are at the Mineral Springs Hotel, which is my favorite place, and I think the most active place in the city of Alton. Um, it was built in 1914. It was never meant to be a hotel, but when they were doing the excavations for it, they uncovered a natural spring, which had a peculiar odor. And this being the early 1900s, water that smelled bad was a huge attraction for people. They were starting spas all around the country and selling it as a marketing gimmick. Come here, soak in the water. It's gonna heal all your ailments. It had two pools. Uh, one for men that was kind of a Turkish bath, and then the other one, which was open to the public. And that particular pool attracted thousands of people every season, but it was in the 70s where a lot of the ghost stories at least began to be told. The problem was that at the time, people didn't have access to a lot of the historical records we have today, so they would usually just make something up. As far as whether they encountered a ghost, well, that must be like, for instance, that must have been an artist who you know, was painting a mural on the wall and he died. Um, he wasn't, but there was a man who died in that room, the old saloon. Uh, he'd had a drinking problem, he couldn't shake it, ended up here, and that was the end for him. And if I had to say it's a ghost that haunts that place, I'd say it was probably him. Um, then there's the Jasmine Lady, the, the famous ghost who haunts the main staircase here. It's said that she was a woman who, you know, had fallen down the stairs back in the 20s, but it, that never happened. We couldn't figure out who that was until I met a man whose aunt had committed suicide here in the building. We took him on a walk through the building, showed him where the room was where Pearl had died, and he was telling us stories about all the things, you know, about how, you know, how much he loved her and how she took care of him after school. But he mentioned that every day when he went home, that his mother would always put him right in the bathtub because Aunt Pearl wore this really cloying, strong jasmine perfume, just like the ghost who haunts the staircase. This is a very spooky, very haunted building. Zombie Road, which is the west of the city a little bit, it used to be an old railroad line. It's now a hiking trail. Uh, but the road itself used to run back to where there, along the railroad tracks where there had been um, silica operations and things. But even before that, its history dated all the way back to, it was a Native American trail. Um, it was used as a road during the Civil War. And there was a lot of violence that took place in that area. Some people think that maybe that violence has kind of left a little bit of itself behind on the spot because it does have a reputation for being haunted. People who go out there at night uh, will often tell stories of the ghosts they see or the strange encounters they have with shadow people in the woods and things. I think it's probably more um, urban legend than actual haunted spot, but it's kind of fun and you can't beat the name. 
I mean, it makes no sense because nothing to do with zombies, but you know, it's a fun name for Halloween, that's for sure. The McPike Mansion in Alton was built in 1869 for Henry McPike. He was a uh, local dignitary, local businessman. He served as the Alton mayor a few times, pretty well liked in the area. Well, he had bought a farm out on the edge of town where he planned to grow grapes. He wanted to start his own vineyards out there, which he ended up doing. Henry lived in the house for years with his family. Um, there's no really horrible history or anything, nothing to explain why it's become known for being so haunted, other than to say that people who have lived there just haven't wanted to leave. Um, I mean, Henry went on a trip to Europe, came home and died in that house. Several members of his family did too. And in the years that followed, as the property got smaller and smaller to the size that it is today, eventually the McPike family sold it off. Other people moved in. Some of them died there. And then eventually it became a boarding house for a while. I spoke to an older woman a few years ago who had lived there when it was apartments. And whenever she and her brother got into trouble, they had to sit out on the staircase outside their apartment door. And she said that while sitting out there, both of them separately would often see a woman and a young boy walking down the stairs, maybe members of the McPike family, because several, or at least a couple of Henry's wives had also died in that house and some children too. Since the early 90s, it has been um, pretty much what you see today. The owners have been trying to restore it and the ghost stories have continued to be told throughout the years. There are seven bridges uh, around the Collinsville area of Illinois. Um, the first one, you, when you leave Collinsville on Lebanon Road, you'll come to gate one. Now, the story goes is that you're supposed to drive through all seven gates in a particular order. That's, that's the legend. Now, the legend varies a little. Some say that you have to get through the seventh gate exactly the stroke of midnight, or you could come all the way up to the edge of the gate and stop. But if you get out of your car, that hellhounds will come and drag you away. You see, the purpose of this is that you are supposed to drive through all seven gates in order, and then when you pass through the last one, you end up in hell. Every one of the bridges has a little story that goes along with it, like one was supposed to have been a man who uh, committed suicide, he'd hung himself after he had accidentally killed a friend. And now you're supposed to see his ghost and he'll wave you through to the next gate. Um, I've driven through all seven of those gates and I'm still sitting here, so I did not end up in hell. The Limp Mansion in St. Louis uh, is, is one of my favorite spots. It has such a great history behind it. I mean, it's, uh, it's German immigrants who come to America and make it big introducing lager beer to St. Louis, one of the first lager beers in the country, and building an entire empire on it. Um, now, the family did have their issues. I mean, they, they made a lot of money, but they had a lot of problems with depression and things like that, where several members of the family committed suicide, starting with their father, William Limp, who was actually the son of the company's founder. Now, he was Distraught, distraught and despondent because his son Frederick, who had been ready to take over the company, had just recently died and he was only in his 20s. And so he just couldn't deal with the grief and committed suicide. Uh, there would be three more deaths in the family, two by suicide. Uh, William Jr., who committed suicide in the Lint Mansion. Charles in 1949, who also killed himself in the Lint Mansion. And then um, William's daughter, Elsa, who died in her own home, but I question whether that was a suicide. And I think that all of that has left an impression behind at the house. You know, before anybody ever thought of turning it into a restaurant in an end, it was a boarding house for a while. And they had trouble keeping tenants because people would be knocking on the doors in the middle of the night. They heard footsteps going up and down the stairs. And then they started working on it, turning it into the restaurant and the inn that it is today. And they already were having problems then too with footsteps and strange sounds and you know hearing things outside the house at night. And the woman that people would see up on the second floor and people would you know, surmise that it was the lavender lady. It's been called one of the 10 most haunted places in the country. And honestly, I think that's accurate. The 1949 exorcism in St. Louis um, is 
I, the most famous in the country, not only because it's inspired you know, so many books and has become such a, a touchstone of St. Louis history, but it also inspired The Exorcist, the film and the book by William Peter Blatty. I mean, the story never even started in St. Louis. It started out in Cottage City, Maryland, and started with weird activity that was taking place in a house. Things were moving, there was scratching sounds, banging noises. Uh, doors slamming shut, opening and closing. Um, his mother sort of panicked and even made the statement, maybe if we go home back to St. Louis, we can kind of get away from this and leave it behind. She said this in a separate room in the house and at the same time she said it, the word Lewis appeared in scratch marks on Ronnie's chest. And that's when they decided that was a sign they should come to St. Louis, thinking things would get better, but of course they got worse instead. And after the exorcism began, this young boy who was at that time 13 years old uh, became what the church believed was fully possessed. Uh, it went on for almost six weeks. Um, it happened in the home in Bel Nor where the family lived at the time. Uh, some of the exorcism took place at the rectory at St. Francis Xavier Church because Father William Bowdern, who was the pastor of the church, was directly involved in the exorcism. Um, it also took place at the Alexian Brothers Hospital on the south side. That's where it eventually came to an end, it was at that hospital. And there, when it was over, there were 48 people who signed statements stating that they had seen uh, what they believed was paranormal activity and believed that it was genuine. But the church decided to leave it alone and not publicize it. I mean, eventually it came out. I spent about 25 years working on this story. I interviewed at the time when I started on it, I interviewed everyone who was still alive. I even spoke to the boy uh, at one time. He passed away in May of 2020. Um, and um, to the end of his days, he always stated that he never really remembered what happened. You know, you could say it was a wild imagination or hysteria. There's a, a thousand excuses you could make. But for me, the fact that this family packed everything up, moved halfway across the country, is pretty convincing that something was going on. And then when they get to St. Louis and this exorcism begins and you've got 48 people who are willing to sign their name and attest to the fact they saw things happening, it's hard to just dismiss that as being nothing more than a hoax.